My name is John DeBono. I'm a barrister. I specialise in medical law. I do uh, claimant work and defendant work. Um, and I'm slightly self-conscious being here um, as a lawyer um, because uh, I'm very impressed by, by this meeting, frankly, uh, in the way that everyone is. Um, and it, it's unique uh, in my experience to have um, coming together uh, patients uh, and medical experts. And as a lawyer, I sort of don't really want to get in the way. Um, but I've been asked to, to give um, a, a medico-legal perspective, and, and that's what I will try to do um, really very briefly. Um, so I'm not an ambulance chaser, uh, and nor am I or Mamuda or, or the other solicitors who are involved. Our, our experience, both when we're on the claimant side, those um, firms are only on the claimant side, I'm on, I'm on both sides, but our experience is very much from when we're acting for patients wanting to get to the bottom of, of, of what's happened. Uh, and um, sometimes it can be useful, even when there isn't a case uh, at the end of, of things, it's the first time that someone has had the opportunity, someone who's got cord or quina syndrome or any other condition, sit down uh, with people like Mr. Wilson McDonald, Mr. Todd, uh, and work out what's happened to them uh, and um, why. So. Uh, that is what the law can do in its own uh, limited way, perhaps shed some light uh, on, on some questions which ideally there'd be an opportunity within your medical treatment to, to discuss, but uh, the real simple reality is that patients don't get enough time uh, with doctors and doctors don't have enough time, um, often through no fault of their own, to, to talk through issues uh, with patients. Um, the, the second uh, reason uh, for having a legal perspective. This is uh, Robert Francis, who's a colleague of mine and obviously known to all of you as, as the chairman of the, the Mid-Staffordshire Inquiry, um, which reported a, a year ago his, his final inquiry. Um, and he said this, actually writing in the Times uh, last week, safe and effective care delivered with dignity and in open partnership with patients should cost less, not more. The NHS's dreadful bill for litigation each year tells its own tale. So what he was saying was the NHS shouldn't be afraid of litigation. It should just try to reduce the incidence of litigation uh, by providing better care in the first place. Uh, and there is a role uh, of lawyers, without getting too holier than now about it, um, in holding um, trusts uh, and, and doctors, medical professionals, um, to account. Uh, and it seems to me one of the things that is coming out of today's meeting uh, is that maybe it's time, certainly what Nick Todd was saying, time for standards to move on and for there to be a better understanding um, that it's not just about whether you're incontinent of urine or not. Doctors should be recognizing things, uh, signs um, earlier on, um, incomplete cord or quina syndrome. And if litigation, if there are financial consequences to, to trusts um, for not recognizing, not improving standards, then that may just um, be at least one factor uh, in improving um, standards. So what I want to, to do is um, just explain to you, uh, apologies to, to the lawyers present and indeed the, the medical experts um, teaching you to suck eggs, but just to, to explain how to win um, a clinical negligence case. And many of, um, many quarter equina um, patients, sufferers won't have a legal case or won't be interested in a legal case. And I'm not trying to persuade anyone uh, that they should go down the legal route, but you're entitled to know and everyone's entitled to know uh, what you would have to do uh, to succeed in a legal case. So the, the first thing you have to prove is that you have received substandard care. And we talk about the Bolum um, test because there was a case called Bolum. Uh, where the High Court said the standard by which, a judge is, uh, by which a doctor is to be judged is the standard of any reasonable um, doctor of that specialty. So you judge a general practitioner by the standard of a reasonable general practitioner. You uh, judge a neurosurgeon by the standard of a reasonable neurosurgeon. And th the reason why I would have a, a medical legal conference with Mr. Todd or Mr. Wilson MacDonald um, with Dr. Budd or, or any of the other experts who are here, is to ask them what is the standard of care of, as the case may be, a GP or a neurosurgeon or a, an orthopedic spinal surgeon. And generally speaking, if what has been done, if the care provided has been of a reasonable standard, doesn't matter if someone else would have done a better job, but if it's of the standard that an ordinary, reasonably competent doctor in that specialty would have done, 
then there is no negligence. And one of the interesting things to come out of what Nick Todd is saying is that, in fact, maybe standards ought to be being increased. And so you do have, in medicine, um, standards uh, being increased. But it's very hard to change standards unless there's education to go with it. So if this charity wants to improve standards and reduce the incidence of cord or equina, then one of the jobs will be to educate doctors so that you can no longer argue that it was reasonable to miss the signs of an incomplete cord or equina syndrome. The, the second hurdle that you have to overcome is to prove that as a result of the substandard treatment, you have suffered avoidable injury and harm. So classically, in a cord or equina case, on the basis of what Nick Todd is saying, if you identify that someone should have been sent to hospital and scanned and had surgery at a time when they were cord or equina syndrome incomplete, then you could have made a difference. Because if you got in there in the window of opportunity before um, th um, they started retaining urine and becoming incontinent of urine, then you would um, make, a better, make a difference to the outcome. Now, just pausing there, and I want to have a, a geeky lawyer interlude just for two minutes, if everyone can, can um, bear with us. Um, Nick, you referred to the case of Hussein um, and, against Bradford. And um, <clears throat> I've read that case, not recently, so forgive me if I, I'm wrong. But I think one of the very interesting things in um, cord or equina cases where there is retention of urine is the impl uh, um, implications of Bailey and the Ministry of Defense. Uh, and those lawyers um, present know that the old um, causation test used to have to prove only um, that but for the negligence, the outcome would probably have been better. There is now uh, this gray area where you might not be able, you can't say one way or another what the outcome would probably have been. It's sufficient to prove that as a result of the breach of duty, so in a quarter equina case, as a result of the delay in diagnosis and or surgery, um, the, that delay has materially, that is more than negligibly, contributed to the outcome. And actually, if you read Hussein, um, you're waiting to get to the bit where Bailey is mentioned. Uh, and it, it really isn't mentioned at all. I think there was a, an attempt in uh, <clears throat> the claimant's counsel's closing submissions to say, oh, and uh, if I'm wrong and everything else, um, it, there was a material contribution from the breach of duty. So the case was not set up uh, to be won under Bailey. And you never know from a judgment. It can be very frustrating as, as a lawyer, to, as, as you know, to uh, read the judgment of a case you've been in and think, well, why hasn't the judge mentioned all my best arguments? But um, looking at that case, I wonder whether really Bailey was argued uh, at all and wh whether the expert evidence dealt with it. So I think for those of you who have cases where there has been a delay after someone um, is CSR, um, don't think, well, there's no case here. I think it's worth looking at those cases uh, and, and considering whether actually you can say one way or another what the probable outcome would have been. And if you have a delay of a few hours, it's going to be very difficult to make an argument that that made a material contribution. But if you have a delay of a couple of days or a week, then I think you might be in very strong ground in arguing that there was uh, a material contribution to the outcome. The other thing I just say at this point is it's clear to me from the discussion that we've had today and from hearing some of the cord equina sufferers themselves is that there is an issue about whether or not cord equina syndrome has ever been diagnosed. So you might have it, but no doctor has ever told you you've got it. And then if, if as a consequence of that, you haven't got access to the right sort of treatment, and we've heard about, for example, the, the, the care that can be provided in the nurse-led service in Sheffield, there may well be patients, and these will be difficult cases because it's very uh, difficult to demonstrate how much of a difference it's, it's made, but you may have patients who actually have had cord equina syndrome for many years, never been diagnosed, and there might be a case in negligence to say they should have been diagnosed. Under the old but-for test of causation, it'd be very difficult to prove that if they had been diagnosed uh, and treated, it would have made a measurable difference. But applying Bailey, you might be able to argue, well, it's not possible to say how much better um, they would have been um, with diagnosis and treatment. Um, but the failure to uh, help uh, has made a more than negligible contribution. Um, and a case might be arguable on that basis. So I just flagged that up um, as uh, a possibility for the future. I just wanted to give two um, simplified, if you like, case studies. Um, 
one where there was a successful claim, one where there wasn't. So case one, failure at A&E. Um, 8th of March, uh, Tuesday, Jenny lifts a box, um, heavy box, has um, acute uh, back pain. Um, that night, um, from a very clear witness statement, she said she had normal sexual sensation. Uh, she passed water normally. Next day, went to the toilet before going to work, um, passed urine and just wiped herself and thought, oh, that's funny, I can't feel anything down there, but didn't think uh, much more of it because she had to go to work. That evening, attended a and &E. And this whole case turned on the consultation at A&E that evening. She was told to go home with backache, very much uh, as we were hearing uh, from our two medical experts. No note was made in the medical record of urinary symptoms or loss of sensation. Uh, so as the case proceeded, she was saying, well, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't um, feel myself, um, I had no perineal sensation. Um, the doctor was saying, well, no, you didn't say anything because I would have written it down. So a point there for doctors, it's very important to, to record uh, a full history, even with uh, negative um, findings. Um, you on to the next slide. Um, later in the week, 12th of March, couldn't remember when, um, normal, uh, no sexual um, sensation. Then on 13th of March, that's a Saturday, goes to see the GP with perineal numbness, uh, and um, she had um, lost sensation uh, when passing urine, and so was wearing a pad. She goes to A&E, has an MRI scan, uh, and has surgery um, that night. Uh, so she was left with permanent bowel and bladder symptoms, difficulty walking, loss of perineal sensation. Question for the lawyers, um, question for the court, ultimately, was care substandard? Well, our A&E expert said that the junior doctor in A&E should have taken a history, including loss of sensation, then perform performed a full neurological examination. Wasn't suggesting there should have been a full neurological examination in every case of back pain, but because of the, a proper, if a proper history had been taken, then there would have been. Uh, and that would have shown, um, there would have probably, and the court would ask the question, what probably would have happened? Well, probably uh, there would have been uh, abnormal neurological findings, and that would have been sufficient, uh, that there should have been a referral for an MRI. Probably that would have shown um, a compressive um, lesion, and then there would have been surgery um, that night or first thing the following morning. Um, so <clears throat> really the issue of fact in that case was, did the patient complain only of back pain? And that's a factual issue. And in so many of these cases, it is a factual uh, issue. And that claimant won her case really because she had a very clear recollection and a very convincing recollection of the progression of her symptoms. But of course, when you're in that situation, you're not thinking, well, in three and a half years' time, I'm going to be being asked by my barrister and solicitor exactly what happened on Tuesday and then what happened on Wednesday and so on. So it can be very difficult. Was there an avoidable injury? Well, <clears throat> if the doctors on the 9th of March had realized that she'd lost sensation, then they would have done the full neuro examination, would have had the MRI, would have been diagnosed, would have had surgery that night, and the outcome would have been better. Um, Second case, no referral by the GP. Um, There's a client called Martin, long history of back pain. First of June, couldn't get out of bed. Out of hours, GP comes, gives him tramadol. Third of June, pain was worse, calls his own G GP. Uh, there are no red flags, uh, just bad back pain. And as Mr. Wilson McDonald said, 90% of patients with severe uh, back pain uh, will be better within six weeks. So it's quite reasonable uh, for a GP to do nothing in that situation. Um, 5th of June, Martin wets himself, realizes there's a serious problem, phones the GP who says, call an ambulance, <coughs> has surgery the next day, um, and has a cord equina syndrome, but it's too late. Um, so was there substandard care? Well, the lawyers go to a GP and says, and ask, was the management by the GP reasonable? or not, and the GP expert says, actually, what happened was reasonable. It doesn't help Martin that it was reasonable, but 
we can't prove that the GP should have done anything differently. So that's, there's no case. Um, no red flags, no reason to refer to hospital. Uh, most people get better from backache without surgery, so the GP did nothing wrong. Um, was there avoidable injury? No, because the first sign of any problem uh, was when Martin became incontinent, by when it was too late. OK, change of subject. Um, no one, um, lawyers are very sensitive about talking about damages, but I find when you actually talk to people who don't have a claim at all, generally quite interested in understanding, and people don't understand, how damages are calculated. OK, so uh, this is not by reference to any um, individual in this room. I'm not suggesting that anyone would rather have uh, damages. If you see, speak to any client and you say, I could offer you all the money in the world or just to be back how you were, it's an obvious question. No one wants the money. But um, just so you understand, if you do have a claim, this is how it works. Damages are intended as a matter of principle to put you back in the position that you would have been in if you hadn't been injured. Okay? And it's exactly the same with medical negligence the road accident with an accident at work. I mean, actually, it's a joke, the concept, because money can't put you back in the position um, that you would have been in. But that's at least the principle behind it. So just to give a simple example, whiplash injury, neck pain for three weeks every day, and then on and off for about a year, you would get somewhere for your injury of between two and 3,000 pounds. If you're off work for three weeks, then you get three weeks lost earnings, unless your employer paid you in the meantime. Much more serious end of the scale, brain injury. Supposing you have a child who is born um, <coughs> in the course of their birth, deprived of oxygen, uh, and they're left with cerebral palsy. The actual injury, the figure for the, the physical injury before you have any of the costs of looking after that child, would be somewhere between 200 and 250,000 pounds. So that's the scale for injuries. 2,000 at the bottom end for a whiplash injury, 250,000 for a brain injury. Then 24-hour care. This is not a question of what you could get away with. It's not a question of if, if you couldn't prove negligence and you were relying on your family and the local authority, you wouldn't get round-the-clock um, care unless there really wasn't any choice at all. But if you've been put in that position as a result of negligence, then you're entitled to um, a care regime to, to look after you. And for an adult, that might typically cost anywhere between 100 and 200,000 pounds a year. If you have a child who has a life expectancy of another 60 or 70 years, you can see that's why you end up with claims um, settling for between five and 10 million pounds. Um, so the care element might be three to four million pounds. Accommodation, David Cowan, accommodation expert, is here. Um, you might need um, adapted accommodation that was suitable for wheelchairs. You might need all sorts of technology so you could open doors um, from your wheelchair, open windows, control the temperature, and so on. You need adapted vehicle. A bill for that throughout your life might be 150,000 pounds. You're entitled as a matter of law if you've received if you're the victim of negligence, there's a, an act of parliament from 1948 called the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Act, act which says you are entitled to private um, medical treatment. Uh, so it's, we always claim that, uh, providing that you haven't told us that you're not interested. You know, if, if you say, I'm never going to, I don't want to have any private medical treatment, uh, then you're not going to have it, so we can't claim it. But if you don't say that, we can claim it. Um, lost earnings over your lifetime might be £300,000, unless you're going to be a neurosurgeon, in which case three, three million. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I meant a year. <laughs> um, in a quarter equina um, case, um, for your injury, I mean, obviously there's a wide range of um, disabilities, and, and some are more seriously injured than others, but you're looking at somewhere between fifty and 100000 Care might be total 100 to 200,000, lost earnings. If this happens to you in your 40s, you've got less of your working life ahead of you. Um, some people manage to keep working. Adapted accommodation, medical treatment, pain management, bowel management, urology treatment. I was asking Mr. Tophill whether um, he accepted private patients in his um, unit in Sheffield, because if we have a patient, a, a claimant who has um, Cordoquina syndrome, and we're trying to map out um, some future treatment uh, for you. 
Um, if the only way you can access that is privately, then obviously we want to try and claim the cost uh, for you. Uh, but Mr. Tophill doesn't, so we have to find another solution. Um, I want to move on briefly um, to move away from damages. And some of the questions earlier um, to Mr. Tophill and David were about accessing services. Um, if you don't have um, a damages action, and you don't have, you're not able to afford it yourself, your only recourse to the help that you need is often your local authority. And it's a fact of life, I mean, it always has been, but particularly at the moment, that local authorities, first of all, there's a postcode lottery, some local authorities are better than others. Um, but the general rule is that priority is given to those who shout loudest, as this gentleman has found. And it can help if you know what you're entitled to. So I'm not a social security lawyer, but I can just give you the, the sort of headlines. The, the main point is this, section 47 of the NHS and Community Care Act. Local authorities call it a section 47 assessment. In any case where you have a significant disability, you should be writing, or if it's a family member, to the local authority asking them to carry out a section 47 assessment because they have to do it. As soon as they have become aware that you are in need or potentially in need, they are under a statutory obligation to carry out an assessment of your needs. And then at least they have to go to the trouble of working out why they're not going to provide you <laughs> with the help uh, that you need. Um, <coughs> but you can get cases where if someone, the assessment might suggest that you can have 15 minutes from a home help on Mondays and Fridays. But that's better than nothing, and it's at least a starting point to start arguing with them for more. So you say, well, if I'm entitled to, if I need 15 minutes on Monday and Friday, why do you say I don't need it on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and so on? But you have to start somewhere. You can request the assessment. You can ask for a copy. Um, mention at the bottom disabled facilities grant. Supposing you're in a wheelchair uh, and you need to put a ramp in to get uh, into your house, or you want to convert downstairs to have a bathroom or, or even just a shower room or downstairs bedroom somewhere to sleep because you can't manage uh, your stairs. Disabled facilities grants, I think they're limited to £30,000. There are all sorts of conditions on them, um, but they are effectively loans from the local authority. So there are things that you can do, uh, and it is worth uh, trying to do those things, but it's hard work to get any money out of a local authority. Um, <clears throat> how to complain. Uh, it's a different point, but if you've had treatment or if you're um, not satisfied with the treatment that you're getting, it is worth thinking about a written complaint to a hospital. If you're someone who's thinking about bringing um, a claim uh, in respect of um, your treatment, that's why you, you, you're concerned that you've got cord or equina syndrome and you shouldn't have it, um, there's really very little downside to writing a complaint to a hospital. Don't say in that complaint, I'm thinking of suing you, because that triggers a legal um, <clears throat> scenario where they can um, claim what's called legal privilege or confidentiality in respect of all the um, <clears throat> results of the inquiry that they make. So if they um, send an email around to all staff saying, um, why has Mr. Bloggs got quarter equina syndrome and you've said you're going to make a legal complaint, then they don't have to disclose um, to you the responses that they get. But if you just say, um, I'm an ordinary patient, I'm unhappy about what's happened, please can you give me an explanation? then you may find that the explanation uh, is one which accepts some responsibility. Um, more often it doesn't, but it gives you some clues, which then mean if you go to a solicitor, that solicitor has a bit more to go on um, before deciding whether or not to take your case on. The most important thing to know is the time limit for litigation is three years. Now, that time limit isn't absolute, so if you've missed it, it's not always a disaster, uh, but you should work on the assumption uh, that you need to um, have instructed a solicitor and the solicitor needs to commence proceedings within three years. Now, that three-year time limit can start at various different times, but as a rule of thumb, assume it starts when uh, you uh, first had your injury. So just to finish, um, I want to consider how to reduce the um, number of quarter equina syndrome cases, and I don't know. Um, but I think in common with those others who've spoken today, and I hope 
those who've attended. Um, this is a good start. Uh, and it's very interesting that Mr. Tophill said the best thing that he ever did uh, in his unit was have a symposium. Um, and I think I've certainly learned a great deal um, today. So this is uh, another start. Um, it seems to me that there's a consensus that better education, particularly of junior doctors, would be a good idea. Um, better culture of note-taking. I've noticed as a lawyer an improvement over the years in the standard of uh, medical notes um, that are written. Um, you don't just want longer notes not telling you anything, but if they're longer notes and writing things down and recording negative findings, um, the discipline of doing that, I suggest, will mean that fewer cases slip through the net. But from a medical point of view, in terms of defending yourself against situation, well, classic situation is patient says, I told the doctor that I couldn't um, feel my bottom, for example. And the doctor says, I would have written that down if the patient uh, had said so. The judge, nine times out of 10, is going to prefer the patient's account if the doctor hasn't written anything down. Because the judge will say the patient is more likely to remember. Um, judges don't buy the argument that doctors would have written it down if something significant had been said. The converse of that is that if the doctor has written it down, you, the patient, can scream to your blue in the face that you complained of a particular symptom, the judge will find nine times out of 10 that if the doctor wrote down um, even a negative finding, made no, um, no loss of sensation, for example, that the uh, doctor uh, made a, a note because that was something that was observed at the time. Uh, so note taking, I think, helps everyone. Um, and then checklist for all acute back cases. I think this is something um, Nick was saying um, at the end, talking about it, or, or James, a card maybe. I don't know if there's a mnemonic that can be um, invented. Um, and just to make sure that all the right questions are being asked so that it's second nature. Because I suppose one of the things that struck me most, just to finish on this today, is that my perception as um, a, a medical negligence barrister is that quadroquina syndrome um, is happening all the time. Um, clearly it isn't from what the experience of doctors, but everyone would agree that one case is one case uh, too many. But the fact that lawyers are aware of so many cases, particularly in the last few years, suggests that there is a real disconnect, if you like, between um, what doctors think the situation is and, and what it really is. And therefore, this is one area where there's massive scope uh, for improving standards. Um, and that's something which this um, charity could very usefully take forward. And I wish you all the best in your fight. So thank you very much. Thank you.